Hey YouTube, it's Auntie Mickey. How y'all doing? It is Thursday night, Halloween. It is, uh, let's see. It's 9.28. And I had three little kids just show up at my house. Ain't it a little late? Ain't it a little late to be trick-or-treating? They would be glad I'm in a good mood. Thug went home today. That put me in a good mood. This little woman showed up with her little three kids. I'm like, ain't y'all got school tomorrow? Anyway. I'm back here to read. Oh, God, I got lipstick all on the tea. Mm, can't take them out and soak them. They don't come out. <laughs> I'm here to read chapter 15 of Who You Calling a White Girl? Who? Please. Into Who. Chapter 15 is entitled Snapped. But before I get started, I need you to like, share, and subscribe the video. And um, if you've already subscribed, you ain't got to do it again. Hit the like button one time. Don't hit it twice because if you hit it twice, it'll take it back. Take it. Take the first one back. But anywho, I'm in my little silly mood tonight, so don't pay me no mind. Hopefully this won't make me cry like the last one. And this one shouldn't be too long. Anyhow. Anyho, <laughs> didn't mean to say that. Okay, chapter 15, Snapped. After Mama's death, this family was in need of a diversion. Even for Daddy and all of his typical negativity, the family found it easier than expected to move on, knowing that Mama lived a long, spirit-filled life. It wasn't enough to just go through the motions of simply accepting those things we cannot change without some sort of celebration. It was definitely true that in order to appreciate the good times, you have to experience some bad ones. And for the sake of balance, we were due for a high point. My family had always been important to me and now that mama was gone, I devoted all of my spare time and energy into being there for my boys. They were both involved with basketball at their high school, so we attended practically every game. Such an exciting time to be a parent. Nothing could compare to the high I felt when Junebug walked up to that stage to receive his high school diploma. Even Daddy attended the graduation, which in and of itself was monumental. Over the years, and especially since Mama's death, Daddy had become somewhat reclusive, so for him to actually dress up and venture out of his tiny studio, studio apartment for an occasion such as this was quite remarkable. Over the next few years, life ran its course with everyday ups and downs. Barry's mother, Evelyn, passed away from terminal cancer. Junebug went to college and God blessed us to finally be able to purchase our first home. It's still here. As daddy grew older, he became more and more negative. Sometimes I would dread seeing his name on the caller ID, especially if I was having a particularly good day. I tried to feel sorry for him, thinking that he was just lonely and bitter from his divorce as well as missing mama, but no matter how much I tried to bring it out of him, he wouldn't budge. There were times that he didn't hide the jealousy he had for my happiness. Nevertheless, I wouldn't allow that aspect of my life to mar what I had with my family. There was no way I would allow anyone, not even my father, to cast a shadow on that. What was waiting just up the road, however, would shake this family to its core. Ooh. Isaiah was now 19 years old, 
and unlike his older brother, did not choose the same path to travel with school or basketball. He still lived at home and had his own ideas as to what he wanted to do in life. Without the instruction of schooling, he managed to become quite a talented barber and was doing quite well in that area. It was only a couple of months prior when tensions built up between him and his father, resulting in a huge argument. It was always difficult as both a mother and wife to be stuck in the middle of disagreements between my kids and their father. But this one proved to be more volatile than usual. In retrospect, I can't help but think I missed a very important red flag that evening. The argument eventually subsided and ended on an extremely positive note. Then one day I noticed that he didn't seem quite the laid back young man we had grown accustomed to over the years. Isaiah was always very private and didn't talk much about subjects in depth, but suddenly he was talking up a storm. As the hours of the day passed, his behavior became more and more erratic. His conversation would turn from one subject instantly to another, and even his topic of discussion became pretty outlandish. I stayed up all night with him, worried out of my mind of the events playing out before my very eyes. By the next morning, he refused to sit still and suddenly began running around through the neighborhood in an attempt to warn the neighbors of what he thought would be the end of the world by three o'clock that afternoon. Isaiah jumped on top of one of the neighbor's vans and Barry was finally able to chase him down. So I called 911. Never in my entire life had I felt so extremely helpless. My sons were my life and I was always there to protect them in every way I could. But this was an uncharted territory and I felt completely worthless and ineffective. I was convinced that someone had slipped Isaiah something. Paranoia took over his mind and wouldn't release him. He thought he was a prophet. He thought he was a psychic. By the time the paramedics arrived, his behavior became so out of control that they had to strap him down and ordered me to leave the room. His screams rang out throughout the house, pulsating through my head to the point that I felt like it would explode. I threw myself to the floor crying hysterically out of sheer anguish for him and frustration for my lack of control over the situation. I thought I had been through painful situations in my life, but nothing could have ever prepared me for this. It was literally the worst day of my life. You could have burned me with a hot poker and the pain would have paled in comparison. There's nothing more agonizing than being a mother with a baby in distress with virtually no ability to relieve his pain. I felt like that young mother frustrated that my baby was crying, but I couldn't get him to stop. It didn't matter to me that he was 19 years old. This was still my baby. And yet, through all of the chaos, it was Barry, once again, that stood as the force of reason and carried me out of his sight. The paramedics took Isaiah away and we followed them in our vehicle. By the time we arrived at the hospital, Isaiah had calmed down considerably, but it was obvious to us that he wasn't the same person we had all come to know. There was a blankness and confusion in his eyes, void of any recollection of reality. When the doctor returned to the room where they relocated Isaiah away from the rest of the patients in emergency, the news was bleak and unexpected. The doctor said, I could only wish it were drugs, Mrs. Ray. That made absolutely no sense to me. How could he say such a thing? 
Society has conditioned us to warn our children about the devastating impact of drugs, yet drugs were the better prognosis? How could this be? When the doctor advised us that our son was bipolar and had described just what that entailed, my world fell apart. He said that if Isaiah were under the influence of drugs, this would have been a temporary effect. But with mental illness, he would be facing a lifelong battle that required daily medication to keep it under control. And we were charged with the responsibility of making sure he took his meds. Just like many young people his age, I knew Isaiah smoked marijuana on a regular basis. As much as I didn't agree with it, I can't stop a grown man from doing whatever he wants to do. It never occurred to me that he was self-medicating. And in dealing with this new set of developments, I began to do the same with the pills. How the hell do we deal with this? Society had drilled us over the years with regards to preparing our children for obstacles in life such as drugs, alcohol, teen sex, and other devastating diversions that could potentially ruin a young person's life. But the subject of mental illness, especially in the black community, has been neglected far too long. The stigma attached to mental illness in the black community has been avoided and treated as taboo. And historically, many black families have been left out in the cold, if you will, as a result of the cultural differences of the predominantly white psychiatric community. Since as far back as I can remember, there was always that friend in school or church that had the uncle in the back room and nobody ever talked about him. We all just knew he was there. And that was all there was to know. You didn't ask questions and people didn't volunteer information. That's just the way it was. It's easy to look the other way when it's not your problem, but when it's your own child, you no longer have that luxury. The situation stares you down like a bully in a schoolyard fight, daring you to make a move. Emotions ran the gauntlet from guilt to blame, from confusion to denial, from helplessness to hopelessness, and of course, the feeling of failure as a mother. And now more than ever before, I yearn to be mothered myself. Daddy tried to be as supportive as he knew how. On a couple of occasions, he literally broke down in tears after seeing his helpless grandson. If Grandpa were still alive, he would have been the same way, but it was Mama who would have been the one with only one answer, prayer. At that point, the answers were clear. We were left with the difficult decision to either taking him home in an attempt to maintain control over his behavior or involuntary hospitalization. Contrary to cultural pra past practices, we elected the latter. Isaiah's mood swung like a pendulum. In his manic state, he would pace back and forth like a caged lion sometimes putting his fist through a wall in an attempt to escape his room in the hospital. His depression would sometimes plunge him into a deep, dark pit of sadness where he would beg and plead tearfully for us to take him out of there. My heart was broken in a million pieces and I couldn't take seeing him suffer any longer. Now was the time to break the stigma. And furthermore, I'd be damned if my son become the uncle in the back room. I came to understand the frustration of the African-American community with our psychiatric care system and why they avoid seeking out assistance for their loved ones. After only, a, only 11 days, the hospital was only too anxious to imply their intent to ship him off to Western State Hospital for a mandatory term of 90 days. 
This would have ultimately done more harm than good. I've never prayed so hard in my life for God's intervention. And after petitioning, petitioning the hospital for his release, he was released and on his way home within an hour. Once back in a more familiar environment and with the love and support from immediate and extended family and friends, we were able to get Isaiah regulated on his medication. The impact on the family as a whole can be emotionally draining. But with our patience and persistence, he eventually transformed into his old self. It's unfortunate that his illness will always be an ongoing concern. And as a result, we painfully remain on guard, watchful of those rare but dreadful occasions when he may severely break again, as he has done on a couple of other occasions since his first hospitalization. All in all, it is still a comfort to know that God only puts on you what you can bear. He has instilled in my son the ability to decipher love from his family, shining even through his darkest depression or chaotic mania. In retrospect, I know now that I allowed difficult circumstances to cloud my judgment and found myself taking pills on a more frequent basis, especially since a recent knee surgery that took me out of commission for a few months. Boredom set in and opiates not only took away the physical pain, they made me feel productive even when I did nothing at all. By the time I returned to work, I became what is commonly called a functioning addict. Unlike the effects of crack, I managed to work every day, paid my bills, and kept my household together. I still performed just as though everything was fine, but in all actuality, I was only fooling myself. Contrary to what I was always taught and knew to be true, as well as the victory over that crack addiction years back, here I was once again, dependent on a substance to get me through the day and ease my emotional pain. After talking to a few close friends, I decided to check myself into a detox at Swedish Hospital in Ballard, where I remained there for five days. I won't lie though, I miss that feeling of euphoria. Ooh, that was short, but I got to add something. I'm going to try to do this without tears. That chapter was about my baby boy. And I referred to him in the, in the, in the present sense. When I wrote that book, he was alive. He's not alive anymore. My baby passed away in July of 2018. He drowned. He drowned in a lake on a little 4th of July weekend with his family. He's gone. But God blessed us with two grandsons. He blessed us with two grandsons. Xavion and Elijah. Elijah's now 18. And Xavion is now 11. They were both present when their daddy drowned. Elijah was literally in the inner tube next to him. When Isaiah accidentally slipped off and went under. So just to add some context to that particular chapter, we don't battle with bipolar anymore because he's gone. I just battle with missing him. Y'all have a good one. Love you.